Welcome to Trash Arts Take, episode 11, season 3. Today is our round, hor- uh, round table on horror, and today's focus is Hammer Horror. And I am joined by Tom Lee Rutter, Michael Fausty, and Robbie Hamstead. How are you guys doing? All good. Hi there. Very good, thank you. Very good. Good. I mean, Robbie, you said kind of, but the majority said good. So, <laughs> so you're all good as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm just about all right. Now, yeah, uh, I think we all are. We we got to we got to keep our head above the above water, haven't we? Otherwise, yeah. we'll go. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Most it's definitely. Funny. Now, I'm going to be totally honest. I am not, not 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 even the word fan. I have never watched a Hammer horror movie. What? I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I'm not a big fan of British things. Um, and I, I've watched half, half a Hammer Horror, The Devil Rides Out, and then never put the rest of the DVD on. But well, that is a good place to start, really. I'd say. Yes, it's yes, it was actually in a box set, so it was a good place to start. So was, it's more. It, sorry, Sam, was it a Hammer box set? Yes, it was. So, so you've just completely like you know <laughs> tossed this thing aside, having watched half of one of the films back in 2014. So about seven back in years. 2014. Yeah. Yeah, so I've not shown it enough respect, but I know there is a lot of love for Hammer Horror. And I thought it'd be interesting to learn from people who love Hammer Horror. So first thing I want to kind of get to understand is, where did Hammer Horror start? What were those key films? <laughs> Silence. 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 <laughs> um, um, I guess, to be honest with you, you know, they kind of get started in about the 30s or the 40s. Um I actually sort of researched this this morning because I never actually really knew where the name Hammer came from. And um, the guy who set it up was called William Hines and he lived in Hammersmith. And um, he he did a kind of day job, which he hated, but his real goal was to become a comedian. And he was part of a double act called Hammer and Smith. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. And um, and the, he just he was Hammer of the comedy double act, and uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody ever really knows what happened to Smith. He didn't set up a studio or anything like that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so there you go. I didn't know that's how Hammer Studios came about. And after... it took a while before they even got to horror, wasn't it itself? Because they were making comedies and yes, film, yeah. coin films stuff like that. I mean, I think initially they they just wanted to sort of distribute other people's stuff. You know, they there was was a big market at the end of the Second World War for just any kind of sort of like cinematic fare. And I think that they were just primarily distributors. But um, I think so the story goes, they had somebody come to them and sort of say, look, do you want to do a Frankenstein movie? And it was this... um, these kind of uh, American guys, one was uh, a writer and I think one was a sort of would-be producer and they entered into a conversation about it. And then they had a kind of sort of chat and realised that Frankenstein was uh, public domain. So they didn't need to bother paying these guys and they just sort of decided then to go off and do their own. And, they just um, couldn't use the Karloff image, is that right? The, the flat book? That's right. They... Yeah. Um, yeah. They had a production manager who was called Jimmy Sangster and they were having this meeting about how they were going to do this Frankenstein movie. And he kept saying, oh, yeah, we could do this and we could do that. Till in the end, somebody turned around to him and sort of said, well, why don't you write it then? To which he sort of said, well, I'm the production manager. But I think they gave him 100 quid and he wrote, you know, the sort of first of those, um, first of what would actually be, you know, the Frankenstein movies, The Curse of Frankenstein. But as Tom said, they started writing the script and they were tipped off that Universal's lawyers were, were waiting in the wings to serve them with a writ. And so, therefore, they had to make sure that there was none of the intellectual property from any of the Universal Frankenstein movie actually in their film. That's crazy. And then you've got the round, kind of round face, as we like to call him as kids, with Christopher Lee, uh, the monster. And yes. He looked... And uh, yeah. that film was actually a lot gorier than you'd expect for a film made so early on in the yeah. 50s. You know, yes. I mean, the monster gets shot in the eye at one point, and then, you know, it's got blood pissing out of it, and it thinks, wow, that's quite graphic for um, a film so early on, you know. 
it really reminds you of all those stories that you're told about. You know, it's all fun and games till somebody loses an eye. And I always think of that scene <laughs> yeah. where Chris Lee gets is, shot in the eye. That was probably the first Hammer film I ever saw as well, with um, because it was just one of those that was on the early hours of BBC Two. Yes. Back in the early 90s or something like that. Yes. And uh, my mum, bless her, she used to t- video a lot of them for us. But then I'd also try and stay up to watch them. And Curse of Frankenstein is the first one. It was, uh, what a great place to start, you know. Yeah. I mean, as Tom says, it was surprisingly gory. And I think what the attraction of those early um, Hammer movies were to um, audiences was the colour. You know, they were oh, shooting God. on sort of Eastman colour stock. And so all the stuff like the blood and that really, you know, stood out. They were very painterly looking films. I mean, beautiful with the paint, like the backdrops and just like Michael said, the colour of the, the emulsions of the celluloid. It's beautiful. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Robbie, what was your first um, Hammer Horror? Um, I think my first Hammer Horror was, um, now I'll probably get this wrong. Is it um, Dracula Has Risen From The Grave? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. It's called that. Is that and... I remember laughing at it because I think it was this one. It might have been another one. I can't remember. But in one of them, near towards the beginning, Benny Hill turns up. And I just <laughs> I just pissed myself laughing because I'm thinking, any minute now, they're going to do the chase. <laughs> well, that was great because obviously a lot of these Hammer films, you'd have all those faces of comedy dotted around in there. You know, like Peter Salis oh, turning yeah. up in yeah. uh, Take the Blood of Dracula and... You know, it's just it's quite amazing. Oh, yeah. to see a lot of famous faces pop up, and you're like, "Oh God!" You know, yeah, in a completely different it's, context, uh, like what you're used to them seeing them as. You know, <laughs> exactly. You know, you're used to Benny or being chased by half naked women, not being attacked by a drap van by Christopher Lee. You know, <laughs> it's quite amazing as well how um, the the two main franchises there, like the Dracula and the Frankenstein, how much they actually rinse those. Uh, yeah. And made so many sequels for them because they they just stuck to the what they knew, I suppose, really. And and whenever they tried to do something a bit different, they always went back to um, yeah. Christopher Lee as Dracula in yet another resurrection scene, or <laughs> and Peter Cushion turning up as Doctor Frankenstein under a different alias, and he escaped the fire, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the last time you saw me, I was at the guillotine, but I escaped yeah. that, and it's kind of like how. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How does it so like you know the, the next time you actually try and slag off these uh, American franchises where they're really far fetched ideas of bringing Freddy back, yeah. then just think, well, Hammer did it first, really. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, in fairness, Peter Cushing never did that whole thing that Christopher Lee did. In that Christopher Lee was forever running down his um his kind of role for Hammer and that whole kind of oh, it was terrible and I never had any lines and when I did they were shit and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Which he, he was forever kind of sort of complaining about the scripts and the films. But it didn't stop him doing a hell of a lot of them. And so, No, no, he, I think he tried for so long to just shed his skin of these Hammer horror films. And uh, I think by the time it came to the 80s, maybe, I don't think he wanted to talk about them at all, did he? You know, he no. No, with Christopher Lee, if you ever mention Dracula, he'll turn, your back, turn his back to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And well, to be fair, he, yeah, like uh, Michael was saying, he didn't have any lines at all in Dracula the Prince of Darkness because he felt it was his lines were crap. But that's actually one of the better <laughs> films, you know. It's a great film. Yeah, but the and thing he is, like, he's terrible. still got top ten, you know. <laughs> yeah, and he was I mean, still. He, he, I mean, he was an incredibly sort of commanding presence, and um, I mean, in many respects, it, it was one of those kind of accidents of history that he got that role as firstly, you know, the monster in. The Curse of Frankenstein, and then he, he got the role of Dracula. Apparently, they were sort of put out a general sort of casting to London agents asking for tall and big actors. And um, it, it came down to a sort of toss up between him and Bernard Breslau. But wow. Bernard, <laughs> Bernard <laughs> Breslau's agent wanted 10 quid, <laughs> and uh, Christopher <laughs> Lee's agent sort of said, All right, we'll do it for eight. So um, <laughs> if it would have been the other way around, it could have been Bernard Breslau as that commanding presence in uh, all of those hammer films. God, could you, could you imagine a lie? <laughs> And then Christopher Lee winding up in all the carry-on. That would have been yeah. quite a <laughs> weird alternative universe, wouldn't it? 
I was going to say that would be one hell of a carry on camping, wouldn't it? With uh, <laughs> Christopher Lee in it. <laughs> it would have been better ended up in carry on screaming, though. I think he would have yes. definitely suffered that, suffered that one, you know. Yeah. That's amazing. I did not know that. <laughs> would I be right in thinking that basically Hammer Horror has always relied more on star power than directors? Because I never hear of any particular directors. Oh, I don't know. Terence Fisher, he was. Uh... Cracking and Freddie Francis. Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of depends because I think there are those sort of Hammer movies that everybody thinks about, which are the kind of Cushing ones. But sort of jumping forward a bit, probably my all-time favourite Hammer horror movie is, is one that stars none of the sort of like big names. Um, Hands of the Ripper, which oh, yeah. one of my favourites. And... It was made in 71, which is the period which sort of most Hammer Horror fans kind of go, oh, well, you know, things are on the slide a bit there. And as I say, it's got Eric Porter in, in sort of like, you know, he's the biggest name in it. But other than that, you know, it's there's nobody of, sort of any significant note in it. And I think, I think the, it's also a case of the studio making the stars, weren't it, really? Very true. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the... As, as Tom says, you know, in some respects, you know, that whilst often they look down on their roles, this this did make people, even sort of Peter Cushing, whilst he did have a presence, you know, he then was somebody who kind of, you know, went on after sort of like, you know, his, his sort of time in Hammer. Okay. I love the cushion. Love the cushion. <laughs> but um, <laughs> though obviously, was, I think maybe with the director thing, it's more of a retrospective. It's like you look back and Terence Fisher was the pinnacle of quality, you know, in, in terms of uh, the glory days and whatnot. And then you'd go push on further through time. And then you'd have Roy Ward Baker. He was more of a yeah. workman-like director, but he also contributed a, a great amount of them. And obviously then uh, uh, Freddie Francis did his fair bit before he, you know, um, this was after he was already an amazing cinematographer. Um, Wasn't there um, Charles Gray as well? Oh, yeah, Charles yeah. Gray. Charles Gray, yeah. He's quite an underrated uh, name, really, because he was, an, again, a gentleman of horror like the best of them, but uh, doesn't quite get the, the the love, the retrospective love, I suppose. I also think no, that, no. that kind of, you know, we, we weren't really selling sort of British movies around directors at that point. All right, you had Hitchcock, who was really just, you know, in America by that point. But... Most movies were being sold by stars at that point. The whole kind of yeah. cult of the director didn't really start to begin until the sort of seventies. That's it. Yeah. I suppose it was just the exploitative value of what the, what they were like packing in the content as well, like the scares. Because yes. back then you could really sell a scare, couldn't you? And the promise of a promise of a good fright would sell the film alone. And I also sort of think from the standpoint of history that we sort of don't appreciate how risque these films were for the 50s in terms of sort of blood and uh, implied sexual content. You know, there was certainly a fair amount of sort of, you know, cleavage and, uh, you know, gore on display. I agree because, you know, um, there's such an easy kind of target to hit in terms of quaint and old-fashioned and, you know, films that were tame when they really weren't for the time. It was only when, like uh, you were saying, like the 70s rolled along that uh, obviously the Amer America gave us The Exorcist and whatnot when it yeah. did actually start to pale. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they tried their best to kind of modernise their franchises and bring us uh, something different, but the franchise areas were probably the weakest point of that, at that uh, time. Yeah, very true. So would you say there's like... I don't know, would you each have one or two essential Hammer horror films that people should check out? So we'll go around the table, you know, our virtual table. And um, Tom, if we start with you, what would be two essential films for someone like me who's never watched them? It's uh, difficult to say, really, because <laughs> um, with Hammer, I uh, go through different phases. and um, But I, I think one that I do keep going back to is... Uh, the ones they made back-to-back, -back, Plague of the Zombies and The Reptile. Yeah. Those are a brilliant pair of films. Uh, but I also love what they were doing with Captain Kronos, the vampire hunter, because it's almost like um, Hammer had kind of like cornered the market in terms of Marvel Universe before Marvel Universe was a thing. <laughs> and it could have been the start of something really interesting in terms of a franchise, but it never kind of happened. 
And that was down to Brian Clemens, I believe, who made the Thriller series. Yeah. And that one's amazing because it's just quite, it's it's different for a hammer. It's like, uh, it's it's got the classic touch points of a hammer, but it's also quite, I don't know, um, it's just more comic book, I suppose, in, in its approach, you know. What time period is that? Oh, what year was Captain Kronos? Oh, I don't know. I think it's one of the late ones. Seventies, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, what the, we were saying. It's like not really the kind of um, great bit. Seventy-four, so that's late for Hammer. That is late. Yeah, but it's a bloody good film. <laughs> so, like for you personally, Tom, do you kind of just do you stick to the later stuff, or you you or is there things you enjoy throughout oh, no. the time? No, not at all. I mean, Plague of the Zombies and the Reptile. That's mid sixties stuff, I believe. Okay. And then. Um, Obviously, Curse of Frankenstein, that's really hard to beat, even though most of Frankenstein ones are amazing. I suppose it just depends what mood I'm in or depends which one I haven't watched in so long, but I'd recommend most of them, to be honest. They're, more worth, they're all worth a run. What about you, Michael? Um, Hands of the Ripper, which I've already mentioned, I mean, one of the reasons I like that so, so much is I do think, I mean, I know this is an overused phrase, but I do think it, it's very underrated. And it wasn't sort of standard franchise fare. You know, it wasn't Frankenstein, Dracula, zombies or a werewolf or even a mummy. And it was just this idea that, um, you know, spoiler alert, um, in, in France, it's called Jack the Ripper's daughter. And that's the basic premise of the movie. The, uh. the sort of central character is Jack the Ripper's daughter, who has witnessed all these kind of, you know, horrible goings on, but has no memory of it. And she then meets, uh, by a series of uh, somewhat unlikely events, a, uh, a, a guy who's just discovered this new psychologist called Sigmund Freud. And he tries to, uh, he tries to sort of solve her problems. But he's got this really quite beautiful ending, um, which is supposedly in the Whispering Gallery at St Paul's. And one of the protagonists um, is blind, but it's just really nicely done, and it's just, you know, it, it's not particularly derivative, whereas virtually everything else that Hammer was producing was largely derivative, or as you know, we've just been saying, a sort of a franchise affair. Um, but I, I, I just think it's really nicely shot. They actually used um, the sets at Pinewood from The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. So it's got quite a nice sort of old school sort of, you know, Victorian London feel to it. Um, and then another one, actually, which I think is possibly the first hammer that I saw, is the 1966 Dracula Prince of Darkness. And again, it's, it's your standard Dracula story, only there's a scene in it in which one of the sort of like hapless stuffed shirts who turns up at Dracula Castle um, is kind of dispatched by being hung over a coffin and having his throat slit. And even though the blood looks like paint, it's um, it still packs quite a punch these days, you know. And to say this is 1966, and it's all in gloriously gory colour. So, yeah, my two recommendations for a starting point would be Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and um, Hands of the Ripper. Nice. What about you, Robbie? Um, mine would have to be um, um. What's it called? The Gorgon. Oh, brilliant. Because um, I think after the Dracula film, that was my second horror film that I watched. And it, um, as a kid, it frightened the life out of me. And because, uh, you know, I'd, I'd not seen like Clash of the Titans or things like that. So I literally thought it was a lot of horrible, like, like Medusa type monster. And, um, and the second one would have to be the yeah, um, it would have to be the, the Satanic Rites of Dracula. How many Dracula films has Hammer Horror made? <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, I believe. Oh no, seven, six or seven, seven. One in without Christopher. He gets about yeah. a bit. Yeah, I mean that's that's a lot of films over a, what I suppose like forty year period. Well, technically, they switched to Count Karnstein afterwards and made a trilogy of Count Karnstein films, which, one of which was um, meant to be the worst of the worst of Hammer films uh, <laughs> output, which is known as Lust for a Vampire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and which was Mike Raven, the former radio DJ turned gothic horror star, um, 
um, you know, chew, chew his way through the film so badly that uh, to inject a bit of charisma, they had to use close-ups of Christopher Lee's eyes to just <laughs> make it work. And then he was dubbed by somebody else completely. And um, this was when Jimmy Sankta was kind of uh, talked into directing. And he's known for writing some of the best Hammer films there are, but not also known for di- directing the worst two Hammer films. <laughs> so what... Um... Is there much like? Are there any like strong female kind of stories? Because a lot you've mentioned a lot of male actors and a lot of male focused uh, monsters and stuff. Well, there's the Countess Dracula. Oh yeah, back to yeah. Dracula. Okay. And <laughs> Ingrid. Yeah, that one. As Vittori, Elizabeth Vittori. That's yeah. right, Ingrid. That's right. Yeah, and there is another one, but I can't remember what it is. Um, Vampire Lovers with Ingrid Pitt as well. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Did they produce uh, many Scream Queens? Um, like... Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, mo- so... the most kind of classic one is probably Barbara, Sh- um, Bar- Barbara Shelley, is that right? Uh, yes, I'm Barbara thinking... Shelley. Barbara Tom, Shelley. Oh, and don't about... forget um, Betty Davis in The Nanny. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Tom, am I right in thinking that you met Ingrid Pitt? Yes, I did. <laughs> As a as a as a well, I was I was about thirteen maybe. Wow! And went to a memorabilia fair and um, and met her at her at her table, and she just fell in love with me for being a child into like hammer horror and stuff <laughs> like that. She gave me loads of signed goodies and said, oh, "I want to take you home." <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'll come home with you in good <laughs> And she gave me a little magazine she was selling at the time called The Pit of Horror which was a little booklet about her life with little articles and posters in it and whatnot. And oh, cool. yeah, I came away beaming from ear to ear. <laughs> it's because I'd only just seen her in um, a series of Doctor Who called Warriors of the Deep at that point. And I had asked her oh, about yeah. that. And she gave me a bit of a tut, but, <laughs> <laughs> but she was happy, happy to talk uh, about anything. She was great. So did um, Hammer, like, ever have the crossover with the more, like, American appeal in regards to, like, because they're obviously relatively low budget, but did they ever have the opportunity to get a higher budget? I think part of their charm was that they, they didn't have higher budgets, and really they, I think what a lot of people sort of don't realise is that the approach that was taken by sort of James Carreras and a lot of those that were actually running Hammer was was purely financial. These were businessmen who were running this and they just wanted to turn a profit. And they signed a deal with Columbia um, for sort of five films a year, which is incredible to actually sort of think a studio could produce that. But that was the deal they signed with Columbia, that they were going to turn out five movies a year for them. And you know, famously, it's, it's recalled by... Um, Anthony Hines, who's the um, son of the guy who set the company up, that they all get called into Columbia's office and there's a big kind of sort of shout up about you're spending too much money on these films, to which they sort of said, well, look, we we could do it cheaper if we were able to shoot these back to back, as Tom mentioned earlier. So they ended up shooting several of these movies back to back, as as, as Tom mentioned, you had um, Blade of Zombies and The Reptile, which was shot back to back. And uh, Rasputin and the Mad Monk was shot back to back with Prince of Darkness. So I think that they're, you know, part of their, their beauty and their charm is the fact that these always were cheap productions. And I think even if you gave them more money, I don't really know if you'd have seen a radically different product, you might have got some bigger names in them, you know, Clint Eastwood or somebody like that. But ultimately, I don't really think that an input of cash was really going to change anything because that was part of their philosophy that they were turning these things out cheaply reusing sets they had a stock company and as i say many of the movies were shot back to back with the same cast and just the sets slightly altered but they were always guaranteed that american distribution deal weren't they i yeah. think it was until, i think it was when the uh, satanic rites of dracula came around that they had lost that that lost those deals yes and they had poor distribution in America, and I think that was obviously a good uh, a death knell for them to actually bother making any more. So I think they they knew that their formula was working because it was selling to America, and then when they decided to pull out because they were probably getting 
the new flavors, the new films that were really kind of horrifying audiences. Like yes. the, that's when I think they said, "No more, thanks. That'll <laughs> that'll be fine." <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Were there any like um, competing companies at the same time that were doing the Hammer Horror thing as regards to British horror? Yes. Um, there was Amicus, of course, which was the Amicus, famous, yeah, um, Pamphlet Blood, and, Blood and um, was it Asylum as well. Asylum's great, yeah. I mean, I I I love the Amicus Portmanteau films because, yeah. well, they're just classic, you know, and they all shared the same kind of casts and you know Ingrid Pitt, Cushing, Christopher Lee, yeah. they'd all turn up in these films as well, and the directors would obviously work for Amicus as well, but Amicus was. Uh, Funded by was he an American or was he Canadian? Milton Sabotsky, he was yeah, North American. So you know that was uh, that his roots in uh, North America, but there was a British studio. I think there was another studio as well, but I can't recall any of the films they made. Called, unlikely enough, Anvil. <laughs> Anvil Films. Yes. That yeah, what did they make? That does sound familiar. Quickly, we all Google. <laughs> there was, there was yeah. films, Tygon films, films. Yes, yes. And they were a bit rough and ready, but they kind of made uh, Witchfinder General. Did they make Witchfinder mm. General? Blood on yeah. Satan's Club, was that them as well? Tony Tensor, he the, was the, the, the Tygon guy. Nice. And then you had, uh, who else did you have? You had, uh, who was, what was that uh, studio that produced Legend of the Well from the Ghoul? Because that was like a hammer clone. Oh, yeah. That didn't last long. I think Freddie Francis maybe directed those. Yes. Or, and who was that? Because I think they were a short-lived, short-lived outfit who were going to try and you know replicate that kind of market. Yeah. I find it fascinating that there was so many like independent, to some degree, studios focusing on horror in those times. You know, for commercial prop, um, reasonings, but you don't get any more. You don't get as much of that sort of, you know, low budget productions churning them out like Bloomhouse do for this country. Yeah, in some ways, like Hammer Horror and that kind of stuff does rely some sort of respect to the modern like Hollywood studios that try to be more independently minded in that regards. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously Hammer thrived on the horror, but then that kind of stopped working for them when uh, sex comedies became a bit more prominent. Yeah. And but then for some directors, they started with set comedies and moved into horror. So <laughs> horror was always bankable. I think it was just the type of horror that they were making that was uh, out of date. Really. What did what did lead to the collapse of Hammer? I mean, I think it was a number of things, but I mean, it can probably be summed up by saying they had a moment, and that moment, you know, came to an end. As Tom mentioned, The Exorcist came along, and that was a real game changer, and. And in many respects, the big studios started making the kind of sort of big budget horror movies like The Omen and Alien and Jaws, which really Hammer was sort of turning out in the sort of 50s and 60s. I also think that towards the end, as Tom was just alluding to, they really went the wrong way with the kind of movies that they were making. So they were making these kind of dreadful um, sort of like film versions of what had been quite successful sitcoms on British TV, like on the buses, man about the house and truly dreadful love thy neighbour. <laughs> and, and at the same time, you know, this I is love a, that film. It's terrible. <laughs> and at the same time, you know, in America, you know, 1968, you've got Night of the Living Dead, then you've mm. got Halloween. I mean, what they really needed was a John Carpenter or a David Cronenberg, but instead we got, you know, on the buses. And funnily enough, they nearly had it with uh, the likes of Norman J. Warren because he, yeah. he was negotiating a few deals with Hammer that fell through and he could have been that new blood that they needed Yeah, because so he was bringing to the table a more visceral and more kind of, um, ex not extreme per se, but more more overtly violent horror yeah. film. Yeah. And that could have been the turning point for Hammer to survive, but... Uh, so it kind of sounds like Hammer lacked sometimes, at least definitely towards the end, was creativity. They lacked those auteurs that were picking up in different places and, yeah, just kind of got left by the side. I mean, the film weren't necessarily bad. I mean, uh, Twins of Evil was one of the last films they did, I think, and that was incredibly good. And uh, But then, obviously, Lust for a Vampire <laughs> came along <laughs> as well. 
which killed, which died a death. Um, but yeah, again, it was just I think the times just were sick of, because you know society weren't scared of Dracula anymore. Yeah, they were, mm-hmm. they were scared of actual serial killers. You know, actual yes. psychopaths. Yeah, very true. And they were seeping their way into the cinema screen as well. You know, and, uh, that's what was res- more resonant. Maybe. I think that's what what I get from when people love Hammer is that they love that kitschness of it all now. Like you, they're not looking to be scared from it; they're looking to be entertained by it. If anything, well, it's funny because it happened before. I mean, you know, when Bela Lugosi was Dracula, everyone was stop stop being scared of him. Yeah, and they were making more atom age kind of sci fi horrors and whatnot. So it's funny how it kind of came back again to have another run over the UK, really. That's true, actually. Yeah, and also, um, I'm probably wrong on this. Didn't they produce the Hammer House of Horror series? Yes. Oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah. It's I well worth mentioning that, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. I mean, in many respects, you know, some of the some of the episodes of that TV show. So it started in 1980. There's about 13 or 14 episodes of it. Some of those are genuinely scary. Um, Oh, yeah. one Some called, of those are actually terrifying. Well, they're horrible. There's one called Two Faces of Evil. Even thinking about it now, it's the one where they, uh, the family are on holiday. It's raining. They pick up a hitchhiker who's got long nails on his hands, and uh, then there's a car crash. And I won't give any spoilers, but Sam, if you've that not checked really out... That one really quite terrifying, that one is. It's nightmarish. Yeah. Yes. I mean, way more scary than the campness of the movies, but... That was probably the last great hurrah, really, was that they took yeah. it to the TV, they modernised it by setting every episode in present day. Yeah. And there was some truly bloody good stuff in there. Why did, no. why did they go for, like, go to TV in that respect? Because I understand now there's more creativity, there's, there's more ways to be able to sell it. But back then, why did they go to TV? I think because uh, maybe because uh, there was a lot of successful uh, horror and supernatural based TV at that time as well, or maybe it's because um, they're on their knees in terms of getting stuff on the marquees. Maybe I'm not mm. sure the full story to tell you the truth. But, uh, also, probably because um, it was more easy to do it for TV, and it's probably like less budget and. Um, it would get more people watching, I suppose. Because I always know people talk really highly about that particular TV series. Um, in particular, actually, um, I remember Fausty when a Fear <laughs> documentary, which is still eventually going to be released, um, <laughs> you talked a lot about Hammer Horror and a lot of the other filmmakers talked about Hammer Horror. And that TV series always came back to something that they, that you guys kind of experienced in your childhood. Yes. And it gave you a sense of it, almost like a gateway horror in some regards. I mean, it was one of those kind of programs, that if you were able to catch it, it felt quite illicit because this was quite sort of adult horror, um, which sort of weirdly enough, the, there's an episode everybody always goes on about called The House That Bled. And um, it's a, yeah, The House That Bled to Death. And um, you wouldn't get away with shooting this today. And it's, there's a scene in it. It's a children's birthday party. And just all the pipes oh, God, kind of yeah. burst out <laughs> blood everywhere. And a lot of the kids didn't know it was going to happen. Um, yeah, safeguarding. And, um, and so they're all kind of genuinely fearful and screaming as they're getting covered by all this kind of, um, you know, sort of stage blood. But... I remember watching that for the first time and being genuinely quite freaked out. And there's quite a nice reversal at the end of that about kind of adults and children, which I won't give any spoilers, but the, the TV show, I think, is is in many respects head and shoulders above quite a lot of Hammer's later output. That's, you know, those, those episodes, episodes, like the one you mentioned, the house that uh, bled, they, they were more in line with what Norman J. Wong was doing, weren't they? Yes, yeah. yeah. So how do you guys feel about the most recent iteration of Hammer? They started with the Woman in Black remake, which, you know, is nowhere near as good as the ITV one. But how do people feel when they came back? And I mean, like, it seems like they've already filtered out again. But yeah. They made a really good one called Wakewood. Yes. Yeah. Timothy Thor was in it. I mean, the, the last act was a bit rubbish for me but the film itself is not bad it's quite folk horror and 
And it was overall quite a decent little film, really. Didn't get many good reviews, I don't think. But it was well I, worth a watch. There's another one as well called The Quiet Ones, which is a bad. <laughs> Um, oh, and it stars um, Jared Harris, yeah. who's um, in um, a show on TV at the moment called The Terror. You know, the he's always worth a watch. And uh, yeah, he's a great actor. Um, yeah. and, uh, and that's not bad, actually. I mean, I think the problem is you take a name like that, the expectations are high. Yes. Um, and in many respects, fair play to them that they didn't go down the predictable route of we're going to make a bunch of campy period horror movies you know mm. they have actually tried to seek out <laughs> some quite innovative yeah. stuff and they haven't just kind of you know looked to sort of rinse the name and make a bunch of cash out of it absolutely that yeah i mean uh, yeah well the woman in black was quite good i mean uh, first first watch of it i thought actually that was pretty decent even if daniel radcliffe was miscasting it but yeah. um but that he's, was only just of... come out of, he's only just come out of hogwarts you know what i mean so you can't expect him to be <laughs> that i mean <laughs> yeah I, I didn't actually see that one. I, I saw the second one, and um, um, I it scared the life out of me. Really? Did it? Did it was it really effective for you? Was it? Um, not so much as the um, the acting. I mean, the actual like um, it wasn't the f acting that was making me jump. It was the out of nowhere music, like boom, that sort of you know that that yeah. it's that that always gets me. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that is what I know about idea. the um, the woman in black in particular. Like, it knows it's very designed for a modern audience in the sense that it just watched Insidious, so there was a lot of that music jump scores to yeah. like make you react, yeah. and it didn't really. I don't know. It didn't make me want to go. Oh wow! Now I want to know the whole history of Hammer Horror, but um, it's always still there, and I, I do wonder if they'll maybe try it again in the future to reinvent it. Because I guess it's always going to have some sort of clout with fans. Was there any? Um, is there any kind of plans to take uh, any hammer further now? Is that we? Is it dormant again, or is it still a thing? Or well, that's it. You just I don't, don't know, hear really. anything. Yeah, you don't hear any announcements, um, and you just kind of get the idea that perhaps yeah, it is dormant again. What would you guys do if you did a if you got to do a Hammer horror film? What would be the things that you'd be like that would be essential to make this work? Ooh, I think uh, that's a big one. Like the witch. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what would be the key elements oh. that every Hammer horror film should have? Well, for me, it would have to be the the Hammer House itself. Because cause the Hammer House, the, the Hammer Horror House actually appeared in quite a few of the Hammer, Hammer films. Like, um, like was it um, The Reptile? Um, yeah. I, I think it also appears in a couple of Dracula films. And um, so it's, um, I would probably do something around with that. Now, this but... is a house that existed by... Uh, the, the the Bray Studios it was it Bray Studios is this yeah. the hope that they had uh, under ownership that they would always film in yes yeah that's the one yeah and it was the same house that was featured in um, Rocky Horror as well oh yes that's the bugger what's it called now because I keep forgetting oh, no it's 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 a hotel now but um, it's also used in Legend of Hell House if that's the same house wow. that's the one. Yeah, I think, the but um, but no, it it was used in um, Rocky Horror because they said in the documentary that the place was just falling apart. You, you had to be careful where you were stepping. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but, let, me, um, let me find the name of the house because that's going to bug me otherwise. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So to. Oakley Court, that's the ah. one. Oakley Court in Bray. That's, the, that's it, yeah. It's, it's right next to the river, isn't it? That's it. Bray, Stu Bray yeah. Studios, Oakley Court. So do you think, to summarise, like as we come towards an end, that it's good for people to remember Hammer Horror in regards to being part of British, British culture instead of something that's a bit of a camp embarrassment? It was a great thing for British independent films. You put back then, that's what people liked. They liked watching a bit of like camp horror. You know, it's, um, you know, 
well, I enjoyed it anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, like like uh, Bobby said, that's what people were loving at the time, so they were making more of them. So, and they've got a certain majestic uh, quality to them now as well in terms of the, uh, the craftsmanship yeah. and the likes of which you don't see anymore. You know, the kind of the film stocks they were using and the, you know, the, t- the technical beauty of it and uh, just the general class. It's just a touch of class, really, much in a hammer film. I mean, I think all of them really um, sort of like punched above their weight in terms of the budget that they were made on, you know, and the fact that they are still being watched all these years later, that, you know, they are something that should be sort of held up and sort of said, look, you know, this was an important part of British cinema. I don't forget, you know, this is probably one of the last successful independent British studios. Yeah. You know, there weren't many other people who came yeah. after yeah. them. And as I was sort of saying, they they were sort of built on this kind of business model of, you know, let's try and shoot it as economically and quickly as possible. But they were using some real kind of like quite high caliber talent. You know, we've not really mentioned their sort of like a uh, stock secondary cast of people like Michael Ripper and all these great sort of stage actors who who were forever bobbing in and out just doing these fairly small roles. But I think around the world they are loved because of their Britishness. And I think often British people don't see that, you know. And I think that, uh, yeah, you know, they're of their time and, you know, there are some shortcomings, you know, with many of them. But, uh, you know, they were of a time and I don't think we should be particularly embarrassed by them. Not at all. I mean, you know, time has time been kind as well to them because... Yeah. You know the Anglophiles of America and beyond. They they absolutely love us for for, the, for those very films. You know, and uh, so they should because they're gorgeous. Exactly, and plus also when they're like being out on DVD and now 4K, they're getting like remastered. They're getting cleaned up and that, so you get a better picture each time. You know, they'll always be with us. Well, thank you very much for joining me, guys. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so check will you out. be watching Hammer films now, Sam? Will you be having another go? Have we you talked no you into this? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll I'll check one of them out at some point. I'll... Have we got to pin? Have we got to pin your eyes open like yeah. uh, Alex Village? <laughs> you got to dust off that box set that's probably in a cupboard somewhere. <laughs> I shall give it a I'm search and give it a watch. <laughs> But yeah, guys, you thank you so much for joining. Back down there, mate. Just you wait. I'm bringing me collection with me. <laughs> oh, man. I look forward to that, being forced to watch things that I should have watched. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, thank you very much for joining me, guys. Um, everybody else, uh, check out, give us a share, a like, all that kind of stuff. I hate doing these outros. Um, but yes, trasharts.co.uk. We'll be back again next week. Bye-bye. Watch more Hammer. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Hammer mania.